Good morning, everyone. We're happy to have you this morning in Sunday School. Um, Thanks for um, understanding last week about us taking a little bit of a break. Uh, We just had some scheduling conflicts, mostly on my end. And um, so I'm going to combine last week's lesson with this week's lesson, uh, and we'll be caught back up to speed. So no worries there. But thank you so much for your patience. But as we always do, before we begin our Sunday School time together, um, I just want to quickly look back over our prayer list. Um, For those of you that have been unable to, um, to attend Sunday School in person, we have been able to remove a vast majority uh, of some of the requests off of our list, which is great. We just give God all the praise, honor, and glory for that. And so um, I'm really tickled about that. God's really worked in a lot of these hearts and lives. He's, he's always working in our lives, but it's so exciting when we get to you know, physically see on paper that we can go, oh, take that off. Oh, take that off. Oh, take that off. So um, anyway, we've been really rejoicing in that in Sunday school. But um we do have um, just a couple of things that I just wanted to bring to your attention. Um, Laurie Lucas's brother-in-law, Don Vance, he's been on our list for a really long time with some heart issues and most of all for salvation um, that she's asked for, um, spiritual concerns for him. But he did have a major surgery um, yesterday, as far as I know. I haven't heard an update um, from Laurie yet, but I, I will try to get with her uh, later this afternoon and find out But um, how he's doing. But he had a, a, a major heart surgery yesterday. He had some scar tissue on the inside of his heart um, that they were really concerned about. So they're going to have to go in and physically try to go inside his heart and remove that. So um, keep him on your prayers. Um, the, the Pounder's niece, uh, Jennifer Springer, um, is also uh, been added to our list. That is um, Bill and Connie Boyer's daughter and son-in-law. This is their niece. And um, she uh, has been having some issues with um, a COVID diagnosis and she has a lot of family issues as well, just personal family issues. So they asked us to put her on there. Um, I also came to my attention yesterday that uh, Miss Joyce Studmeyer uh, had to be taken to the hospital um, in a rush uh, at the end of this week. And she had a perforated bowel, uh, bowel but um, she had emergency surgery yesterday at UAB. And when we talked with Mr. Johnny last night, uh, she was doing much, much, much better, even though that was a very serious and scary situation. Um, But he just asked now that we just pray for um, a good recovery for her because she's in a good place now. And so they they feel much more confident about, um, you know, how the outcome will be. So just wanted to mention those to you. If you um, weren't aware that we're having trunk or treat Wednesday night as normal, as we have had in the past. Uh, We're going to continue to have it, but it's just going to be a little bit different. Uh, It's going to be a drive through this year. So our participants are strictly just going to drive their vehicles through and we will hand the candy and the treats out to them as they pass by each trunk. Um, So anyway, we're excited to be able to host it. Um, But also, you know, we're praying that God will uh, give us good weather and um, that it will, um, you know, be a night that brings honor and glory to him and that we can still share some Jesus um, you know, even in these different times. And so we're excited about that. So just pray that um, that God will lead us in the right direction and, and that everything will get set up correctly because this is our first time to ever do it. Um, and that we'll have safety. Kind of always makes me nervous when there's going to be a lot of cars in the parking lot. We have our own church kids that'll be there. So just, you know, just pray his hedge of protection around all of it for us. And uh, if you're out and about and want to get you a treat, feel free to drive through. You won't have to get out of your car or feel uncomfortable at all. So um, anyway, um, just wanted to throw that out there. But let's go ahead and bring all these requests to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity that we can open up your word and we can study together. But dear God, as we study your word, we know that your word tells us to come to you. And, um, And we can do that because... (laughs) <laughs> you are God, you are Yahweh, you are the great I am. And we thank you and we praise you for that. And we come to you in complete confidence with all the requests that are on our um, extensive prayer list, dear God. And we know, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. We all probably have things um, that we haven't been able to bring to the table because we're unable to get together or maybe we just haven't had a chance to make that phone call or send that text message to let us know that there's a need. And so for those things that we're unaware of, dear God, we lift those up to you. For those that um, that we are aware of, dear God, that have been on our list for a really long time, we ask you to continue to be with them. And for the new ones that we've added, dear God, we pray your um, your 
just protection and your um, your hand and, and of encouragement and healing on them. And for those that have had surgery, dear God, we pray that their recovery would, would go well and that you would just continue to watch over and take care of them, be with their family as they um, they stand by their side and as they try to minister to them. And um, dear God, it's just such a crazy time to try to minister. I know that Todd gets very discouraged and disheartened um, that he can't go and make visits and um, is not allowed into some of these hospitals. And, and we understand the reasoning behind all that but at the same time you just kind of feel like your hands are tied sometimes but dear god help us not to um, forget that the, the most effective thing we can do is to pray um, and to bring these requests before you. And so I pray, dear God, that we would take every advantage of that and just continue to lift these things up to you, dear God, because you want to hear our hearts. Your, your word tells us to cast our anxieties and our fears upon you because you care for us. And uh, and we thank you for that verse in, in, in the book of Peter, dear God, and we just claim it right now. And dear God, we lift up our chunk or treat. Um, we pray, dear God, that um, everyone would stay safe. Uh, and this would be a great night of ministry and outreach for our church and um, that we would just have so much fun, dear God, just uh, reaching out to the people in our community and that you would just bless our efforts and, um, and, and do this so that your gospel can be furthered, dear God, through this little simple event of a candy corn or a Rice Krispie treat or a pack of bubbles or whatever it is that, that might be given away, dear God. I pray that um, we'd be able to share the gospel with those through just something simple as a treat. Now, dear God, be with us as we open your word. Just speak to us what you would have us to learn. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So this morning, like I said earlier in the introduction, we're trying to kind of piggyback um, two lessons into one. So we are um, beginning um, a seven week study, um, really seven weeks, I guess, if you started last week um, on commitment. And the title of the theme of that is all in a life of commitment. And, you know, you think about that word commitment and um, what it actually means. And uh, Jesus spent, you know, years of, of his life um, fulfilling his earthly ministry. And during those um, those three years, particularly uh, that we think about in New Testament um, stories that we get in the Gospels, he talks a lot about commitment. In fact, he makes it clear that commitment is a key part of being a follower of his. And so for these next few weeks that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be um, talking about what it means to be all in and to have that life of commitment. And last week's lesson, um, before we can really talk about um, what that means for us being committed um, spiritually, we have to first look at how Christ had a commitment to us. Christ has a commitment to us. Christ is committed to us. And that was what last week's lessons talked about. And so we were looking in the book of Romans 5 and um, chapter 5, and we looked at verses 6 through 12 and 18 through 21. But just to get us started, just thinking about it, um, you know, so many times we hear that word commitment and people just get nervous just thinking about it. I mean, why? Why do we get nervous thinking about it? Because our culture today is becoming just more and more increasingly um, averse, I think, to this idea of commitment. The bottom line is that we just don't like it. I mean, you know, think about, um, you know, just all the things that, um, you know, we have those commercials that are out there, you know, everybody's jumping at the bit, you know, to get on this special price that's promoted by whatever company it might be out there, whether it's, you know, try this remedy for the next three months, you know, blah, 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 um, you know, and, or take this cable promotion from this cable provider, you know, and we're all excited about the special price that we get at the beginning, but then everybody cringes back when you discover that to get the rate, you have to, you know, be all in for a whole year. There has to be a year commitment behind it to get the special introductory rate that's out there. Um, you know, and I know that's kind of a silly example of it, but let's think about a more serious example. You know, what about our marriages? I mean, traditional marriage today, oh my goodness, that's been on the downside for decades, um, but it's almost a free fall now. Um, you know, it, 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 it said, it gave a statistic in our book that says it's estimated that 25% of marriages, um, you know, or people that, um, I guess 20, I'm sorry, let me read it right. It's estimated that 25% of people People will never marry. And the main reason is because of commitment. Um, you know, <laughs> that's why people live together. You know, they don't want the commitment of the marriage. Um, you know, like I said, it's just on a downward spiral. Think about joining a church. People don't join the church. Why? Because they don't want to be accountable. They don't want to, they say, well, I just don't know if I can be that committed. And, you know, I have conversations with people like that all the time. But the word commitment, you know, shouldn't be a scary thing um, to us. And it's much more palatable when we know that the other person is committed to us and has our best interests in mind as well. And that's why, um, you know, it makes our 
relationship with God so special because he was committed to us before we were ever committed to him, you know, and uh, on top of that, when our commitment to him wavers, he never stops being committed to us and we mess up all the time. So the greatest display of, of his commitment to us is what he provided for us in salvation. So um, that's kind of what we, you know, we find from last week's lesson. So I'm going to read the scripture from last week's lesson and just give you three main points um, that will just kind of let you know um, how he is committed to us. And then we'll move on to today's lesson to catch everybody up. But Romans 5, 6 through 8 say, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the point of today's lesson or last week's lesson says, even at our worst, Christ was fully committed to love us and bring us to God. So there are three things I think that we can learn from um, what we were looking at in uh, last week's passages about God's commitment to us. And the first thing, you know, is that um, he proved he was fully committed to us because he died for us. Um, that's the first thing that we see there. He died for us. And, you know, it, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around, um, you know, somebody dying for us. Like the scripture says, you know, um, but but how cool is it that it says just at the right time while we were still powerless. We know we're powerless because what? It goes all the way back to the days of Adam. When the first sin came into the world, we were powerless to get away from it. Sin is going to be there. We're not going to get away from it. But God did provide a way of escape for us for the consequences that sin would bring our way, the eternal consequences. And so at just the right time, it says Christ died for who? The ungodly, because he knew that, that there's nothing godly or good about us. But think about it. <laughs> Very rarely, it says, was anybody going to die for somebody who is good, for a righteous person? Now, I mean, you think about it, you know, you know, a mom's going to die for her children or a husband says he'll die for her spouse. Um, you know, um, there might be something out there that would compel you to die for another person. But um, think about it. That's probably going to be somebody that you know, somebody that you love, somebody that you have a relationship with. But how many of us are going to just going to say, I'm going to lay down my life for somebody I have no affiliation with whatsoever, or I'm going to lay down my life for the murderer, or I'm going to lay down my life for the drug dealer. I mean, you know, we're <laughs> nobody's likely to do that. You know, like I said, it's hard enough to find somebody that's going to lay down their life for a good, for a righteous person. But it says God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. He died for us. And I found a little uh, example of that. Just thinking about me being a teacher, um, you know, how a lot of times we um, we equate, um, you know, our performance on someone's love for us. You know, you think about your kid um, when they're in kindergarten, you know, I teach, you know, and if everybody has a great day, I have a traffic light in my room and everybody stays on green. They had a great day. They go home with a smiley face. Um, if you had some warnings during the day, you know, and I had to keep calling you back out about something, reminding you about the choices you're making, then you're going to get a straight face and you moved your clothes pin to yellow that day. Right. Um, but if you have, if I have to completely call you out and you have to come sit with me in time out, or if I have to send you, um, you know, to sit with you, the assistant director, um, you know, completely removed from the classroom situation, then what you made your clothes been all the way to red and you're going to get a frowny face for the day. Um, you know, and so it was talking about um, one day last week and my devotion time about a mom that was thinking about how every day when she met her daughter on the driveway, you know, at the end of school and she got off the bus, she would bounce off the bus. Mommy, I stayed on green. I stayed on green, you know, and how excited they were skipping down the driveway together. And uh, she said, but it, then it started kind of convicting her heart that maybe her daughter was equating her love for her with the performance that she had in the classroom that if I stay on green, mom's going to love me today. When really and truly the mom was saying it didn't matter if she moved her clothes into yellow or if she got red every day and came home with a granny face. She's my child and I'm going to love her no matter what. And that's what this passage is saying to us. You know, God gives us that green light grace. Um, that's not green light grace for us to sin, but it's saying that he knows we're going to mess up. But in spite of that, when we were still powerless, he died for us because he knew we were ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's the first thing that we see. 
come is that, you know, God's all in and he's committed to us because he died for us. Then we read in Romans 5, 9 through 11, since we now have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were still, I mean, for if while we were still God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have been uh, and have received reconciliation. So not only is Christ all in because he died for us, but he's also fully committed to us because he's reconciled us to God. How did he reconcile us? What? Through his death, um, you know. Um, just quickly to kind of highlight all that, we see he makes us righteous, what? By his blood. We know the word righteous means what? Right standing, right conduct, right living. We've talked about that a million times. And God is perfectly holy, um, you know, and because of his holiness, he can't be in the presence of our sin, you know. And so because of that, the only hope we have of entering into his presence is if we made completely righteous, you know, in Christ. And he does that by what? By reconciling us into himself. Um, and he reconciles us to save us from his wrath. Um, and he did it once again, back to his dying. He does it through his death on the cross. So when Christ's blood makes us righteous, we're saved from that wrath of God. God's wrath Wrath, though, doesn't look like human wrath. You know, we think about human anger, you know, that can be stirred up and poured out in almost like a tantrum-like fashion. But his, his wrath is quite the opposite. Um, it's God's reasonable response to our sin. We deserve God's wrath because we're sinners, but we're saved from it because Christ pardons us from the penalty of our sin, and he makes us right with God through his death on the cross. So his death provides us grace and mercy. Um, you know, and um, somebody sent me something um, one time on my phone that I thought was a really cool, um, I guess, um, example of that. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, here it is. It says God's uh, grace is when God gives us good things that we don't deserve. Mercy is when he spares us from the bad things we do deserve. Blessings are when he is generous with both. Truly, we can never run out of reasons to thank him because God is good all the time. And um, anyway, I just thought that was really cool uh, and a great way to put, um, you know, what the scripture is saying to us about that reconciliation. So he's all into us because he died for us, because he reconciles us. And then the last thing in the scripture that we see from last week is that Christ is fully committed to us because he gives us eternal life. So um, still in Romans uh, 5, 12, then we skip down uh, to verse 18 through 21. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of the one man um, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death. So also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what do we learn about the impact of sin from these verses? <laughs> well, sin was impacted on us because what? Because the sin of what? One man. And these verses right here, Paul really talks about two men. He talks about the one man that brought sin into the world. All right. And if I were to ask you, who is that? What would you say? Adam. That's exactly right. And then um, he talks about, you know, how that came about because of that one decision, man's decision, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden to to what? To eat the fruit that they were forbidden to eat. You know, Satan comes in and, and they say, well, you know, we shouldn't eat the fruit. You know, God says, if we do, surely we'll die. And then what does he say? What? You won't die. You know, and, um, you know, he just lies, lies, lies to him. And so the sin there became a reality in our lives. So from Adam's day to present, this tendency to sin continues to poison us, you know, and the effects of that sin continue to contaminate us. And it always does bring death. You know, even though he told him death's not coming, we know that we, we see that today. Death is the result of our sin and it greets all people. And the reason is simple because all of us are guilty of sin. So the one man brought sin into the world, but we can take heart because this is, it only took the one to bring it in. <laughs> you know, Paul continues to give us the account of God's plan to save us by introducing us to the other man, <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ himself. He finished the drama of that sin that Adam began. And he even pointed to the one trespass Paul does 
that says that open the door for all people everywhere to sin. And he, he says, but, but just in that same way, he says what justification takes place, you know, through that one righteous act of what Christ did for us on the cross. And so, um, you know, we've all sinned. And, uh, you know, it says in that last part of verse 20 there, the law was brought in so that uh, in, brought in so that the trespass might increase. You know, we just came off our big study on the Ten Commandments, um, you know, and so the law, uh, we realize, allowed people to see themselves and their sin, you know, um, in a more exponentially greater detail. I mean, you know, I, I, I myself, um, you know, you think about reading the Ten Commandments, just reading them, you go, oh, I don't have a problem with this. I don't, I don't murder. Um, I don't misuse God's name. You know, you just say, well, I don't have a problem with this. These are not things. That, but when we really broke them down and we looked at them, we saw how, uh, yes, that, that we can, um, you know, um, misuse God's name, not just by calling it out by the way that, that we live our lives. And we did talk about ways that, um, that we, um, you know, what that word murder meant, you know, not just in physically taking a life, but in, um, the way that, that we treat other lives and how we just, you know, we, we have no respect for other lives and how, um, you know, we inflict, um, that pain on people in their lives just by our actions. And so, yes, we all struggle with them. So the Ten Commandments they weren't set to save us, but to enlighten us, to give us a bar that is set for us to strive toward that obedience, but also to make us understand that, that our sin is out there, that we can never completely keep all of this. And because of that, that Christ died for us, what, just as sin reigns in death, you know, it says that his grace reigns through righteousness to bring us that eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So even though we deserve that death and that sin, you know, he has provided that a way of escape for us. You know, and many people, you know, out there in the world today, they're going to ask us for commitment to a lot of things. And there's plenty of reasons that we can come up, uh, you know, with not to commit, you know, because we're afraid of that word. But, let you know, put all that aside and let's think about our spiritual well-being right now. God is committed to us and he's just awaiting that response, um, you know, from us to just to reach out and grab onto that commitment um, that he's saying, I'm committed to you. And even when we mess up, he's still committed back to us. Um, so that kind of brings us up to speed that even at our worst, Christ was fully committed to love us and bring us back to God. So that brings us to where we are today. So we're looking today, now that we understand how he's all in for us, we're going to see how we respond to that and our commitment to him. So think about something that you enjoy being committed to. Um, you know, what are some things that just pop into your mind? Um, you know, I, I think about my marriage. Um, you know, is marriage hard? Yes, it is. But I enjoy being committed to it. Um, you know, teaching children every day. Is that hard? <laughs> yes, it is. But I enjoy being committed to it. Parenting. Is that hard? Uh, yes, it is. But I enjoy being committed to it. Um, I think about my church. I think about uh, leading and planning worship. I think about, you know, just simple, um, you know, getting out and exercising every day, you know, going for a run in the afternoons when I come in from work. Um, is that a hard thing to do? Yes, it is. But I enjoy being committed to it because the benefits are, are you know, there's they so much outweigh. Um, you know, me just getting in there and saying, okay, I'm going to run today. When I think about the long haul and, and the same way with all of these things, marriage, um, investing in children, you know, parenting, my church, my leading and planning worship, all, you know, and I could just go on and on and on. There's so many things that we have commitments to, you know, our jobs, um, you know, everybody's job is different. Mine does have to do with children and that, and that influence. But, um, but, you know, there, there is um, an issue with the things that we're committed to today. Um, but we're, and I guess it's just the day and age that we live in. You know, my parents always taught me, if you start something, you finish it. You don't just get to say, well, I'm going to do ballet, you know, this year. Uh, but I get into it three weeks in and the, you know, the recital is, you know, um, six months from now. And I say, well, this is just, I don't want to do it. They're going to know you're going to dance until the recital. At the end of the recital, if you want to say this just wasn't for you, that's fine. But you're going to see it out. You're going to finish it till the end. Um, and we implemented that same thing, you know, with our kids. Um, because, um, you know, there's there's some importance to that word commitment, um, you know, and in our spiritual life, commitment is important as well. We just saw from how last week's lesson, God is totally committed to us, um, you know, but the point of today's lesson says that we're to commit our whole life and our trust and our obedience to Christ because of what? Because of what he did for us. Um, think about reality TV today. Oh, my goodness. Um, this is not something new. Um, but once it did hit the television, it just seems like it just took off like 
you know, gangbusters, you know, and every, you can't hardly watch TV one night that there's not some kind of reality show that's on. Um, you know, one of the ones that's most popular right now that people love to watch is that American Ninja Warrior, you know, and uh, you just think about the things that, um, the challenges that these people put them through themselves through each week, you know, they're, they're these huge obstacle courses and they have to be in this great physical condition. Um, and these athletes have been in intense training for months. It is no small commitment. And while, <laughs> you know, you may not be trying to achieve the same title as the great American Ninja Warrior, still your life revolves around some type of commitment just the same. Um, you know, a quick look at, at a typical week in your, your life will reveal just how many commitments that you have. Um, you know, it named off some, it just said our family, our friends, our jobs, um, a new skill that we're, uh, you know, we're involved in practicing a new hobby, working out at the gym, all of these things call for a level of commitment. Uh, and as we think about those levels of commitment, there's always going to be an obstacle, um, that's going to be in the course of our challenge. There's always going to be there. And so our commitments are going to reveal what we love. You know, we say, you know, your heart, what's inside your heart. That's you search your heart. You're going to see what you're really committed to. Look at your checkbook. You're going to see what you're really committed to in life. And so our commitment reveals the things that we love. Right. And so in the Bible, we read about commitment and specifically God's love for us. Um, like, like we said from last week's lesson, he's fully in committed to us. So today, the real question is how we're going to respond to that commitment. What is our commitment to him look like? So we're going to be um, going back in the New Testament. We were in Romans. So we, we went forward in it, but this week we're coming back to one of the gospels. We're looking in the book of Mark and we're going to see, um, you know, um, what Jesus perspective on, uh, on this lesson today. And so, um, you know, at this point in Jesus's ministry, um, he knew that he had to, to, to really kind of hammer down, um, you know, what was about to happen because he knew that he was very close, um, you know, to the suffering and the death that, that he was going to face on Calvary. And so as he's traveling, um, in the book of Mark here, he is taking every opportunity to make available uh, to his disciples and prepare his disciples for what's about to happen. And so in this passage we're looking at today, he gives serious attention uh, to the need for total commitment to him. So um, like I said, we're going to begin re reading in chapter 10. And um, and as we do that, hopefully we're going to understand better the importance of living a life of commitment and what that means uh, as his follower. Um, and to know that as we go through this life of commitment, that we don't have to do it um, on our own strength, in our own power, because he's provided the Holy Spirit for us to help us be successful, you know, at, at following in, in, in a life of commitment to him. And so we're going to begin, like I said, in verses 13 through 16. And it says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked him. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. So we see from these verses here, um, you know, that first of all, we there's a total commitment to Christ when we place that that childlike trust in him. So we're looking at our commitment. There has to be that childlike trust. And so Jesus has been working, you know, with his disciples, preparing them, like I said, for his death at the very beginning. And he's recently even told them for the first time that that uh, that he is going to die and that he's going to rise from the grave three days later. Now, I don't know that they fully have comprehended all this yet, um, and it probably hasn't sunk in, but uh, on the road to Jerusalem, he has stored truth in their minds and hearts that are going to hopefully make sense to them after his resurrection and his ascension. So he's trying to prepare them and get them ready. Um, and one of these unique opportunities that presents itself uh, is comes in the faces of these little children that are here that we read about in these verses we just read in 13 through 16. Um, you know, people have brought their children to meet him. Um, they wanted to give the children, uh, you know, a Christ's blessing, um, you know, and um, it, 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 that was really a big deal, you know, back in biblical days. And so Jesus would, um, you know, would, would place his hands on the children. And uh, like I said to them, that would, that would be, you know, something that would make a world of difference because it was a, it was a biblical thing all the way back to old Testament days to receive that blessing, um, you know? And so um, they were, they were excited to bring their children here, but the disciples reaction, you know, uh, <laughs> was, was totally different that they were not that excited to see the children. They considered the children to be in the way. And so they kind of, um, 
you know, gave a, a, a cruel response, you know, back to the parents. They didn't believe that that the children should even be seen there, um, you know. And so in in verse 14, uh, we see that when Jesus saw how the disciples were rebuking the children, the scripture says that he became what? Indignant. Now, what does that word mean? It means to show anger or annoyance um, at, uh, at an unfair treatment uh, of someone else. And so, you know, Jesus it really and truly, we haven't seen really any passages very much to this point where, you know, Jesus has this response with his disciples before, but, um, but when he watches how, you know, the disciples are rebuking the children, uh, he puts that indignation to work by ordering his disciples to allow the little children to approach him. Um, you know, the disciples didn't know that Jesus wanted the children to come closer, but he got their attention, you know, so they stopped rebuking the children and they started letting them make their way to Jesus. And the disciples were probably very bewildered by this. They probably didn't understand, you know, why this was the response of Jesus. Um, they didn't understand the reaction to their effort to clear his path, you know, by getting rid of the children. Um, and there was probably, you know, <laughs> probably a sense of awkwardness there. You know how <laughs> we always say awkward, you know, when something happens. Uh, well, that's probably how the disciples felt right now. But Jesus was using this as a teachable moment to instruct his disciples about the meaning of total commitment to him. Um, you know, he probably did shock them, you know, when he pointed to the children as role models for citizens in the kingdom of God. Um, and we read on in verses 15 through 16, when we see that the little children were gathering around Jesus, um, you know, and, and they they, it says that he declared that the little children provided the disciples with a critical principle about living as a citizen in the kingdom of God, you know, and he wanted them to embrace this idea that he was trying to get across. Um, they were the perfect example of, of this citizenry um, in his kingdom, you know, because why? They fully trusted him. I mean, they came right to him. Um, you know, it's amazing to me how children will just do that. Um, you know, working uh, at the preschool, one of my biggest fears um, now that I'm um, you know, directing as well as teaching is that I will send the wrong child home with someone, you know, and so there's all these security measures as to who they'll go home with, um, you know, and only this person is allowed to pick them up. And of course, this year, um, <clears throat> it, I, it, it's a lot to me, um, somewhat easier to contain because parents aren't even allowed in the building, um, you know, due to all the COVID regulations. So, you know, we're checking, you know, IDs and stuff at the car and signing out and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but in the past, you know, we've had, uh, you know, parents walk in, you know, to get the children. And I can remember specifically one time when a little girl, uh, an older gentleman walked into the center and a little girl that was sitting in a carpool uh, area, you know, we have like they're lined up with their little classes or whatever when it's time to dismiss through the carpool. And this little girl just gets up, you know, she's like two or three years old and she runs with just total, you know, abandonment to this man and, you know, just runs at him full force, you know, holds her hands up and he just grabs her and picks her up and you know starts talking to her and we're all thinking obviously this is her grandfather or her uncle or something but we come to find out man has no relation to her whatsoever but this little girl is just she's ready just to jump in to his arms and just walk out the door with him you know <laughs> because she just has that childlike faith that trust apparently he looked like her grandfather or somebody in her family I don't know but she was ready just to give herself all in you know and that's how these little children were they they came to Jesus with a simple faith and a simple trust and they gave themselves totally to him without reservation and with total commitment you know, and so therefore they're modeled for Jesus's disciples, um, you know, the way to enter God's kingdom. The example they set, you know, helps us understand more about Jesus and how he wants us to live for him. You know, they come and they they live as uh, as helpless little individuals who have no choice but to depend on somebody else for everything that they need. They can't secure their food. Um, they can't secure their clothes and they can't clothe themselves. They can't get themselves from one place to another. And therefore they have no choice but to what to Detroit trust into someone else to provide for them totally their food, their shelter, their clothing and other essentials that they need for life. And because they, you know, they willingly entrust themselves into the hands of somebody else, then they portray the heart of a person who is fit for the kingdom of God. Um, you know, and, and that's that's what Jesus is trying to get across to them. People belong in God's kingdom when they recognize what their helplessness, our spiritual helplessness and know that there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And we come to Christ in complete trust. Um, you know, I went back uh, at the beginning of that and said that they they wanted Jesus what to place his hands on them is what that first part of the scripture said. 
And the reason for that was I kind of just barely touched on it. But in those days, um, the people placing an extremely high value on a formal blessing, um, you know, especially in the Old Testament. You know, think about, you know, Jacob, you know, the story that we have where he blessed his sons, you know, and we talked, you know, that you wanted the blessing of the birthright. So to physically place your hands and give someone a blessing was of huge importance, you know, to, to the people of this day. And when Jesus turned his attention to the children so he could bless them, he gave his formal approval of childlike trust that they placed in him, you know, and in a way, you know, the hands of Jesus have been laid on us, you know, as his children, when we have come to him in that simple childlike faith, you know, wanting to trust him for our salvation. Um, you know, so when you look at this event from the disciples perspective, you know, their rebuke makes sense. I mean, Jesus is a really busy man. He's doing some really important things. He's teaching, he's healing, he's building the kingdom of God, you know, and this was the uh, the work with an eternal impact. So Jesus didn't have time to play with these little kids. Um, you know, is that right? Um, you know, no, not at all. I mean, you know, he is, um, like I said, he sees that and he says, you know, no, let them come to me you know, um, and let them come to me in this childlike trust, um, you know, and it, it asked the question in your book, it said, what is the difference between childlike trust um, and simple blind faith? And if you look at the two definitions and I looked them up, it says blind faith is lacking in some component of information, but still continuing to believe in something. You can have faith that something will occur, knowing that the evidence suggests the outcome. Um, you know, but blind faith is having faith that something will occur with no evidence or conflicting evidence against that outcome. Um, you know, so there's a difference, it says, between faith and blind faith, um, you know, and that's what he's talking about. He's not saying to come in blind faith. He's saying to come in childlike faith, um, in child trust, you know. Um, when is the last time that you saw someone come to Christ with a childlike faith? You know, and I know we probably all want to think about that little child in BBS, you know, that just comes, you know, and has no questions. Well, what about this? Or explain to me that, um, you know, and that is a great example. But in reality, you know, the first person that should come to your mind that came to Jesus in a childlike face should be yourself. Um, if you have a relationship with him, the first person that comes to mind to me should be me, um, you know, because. Jesus says, let the little children come to me, you know, in that childlike faith. And by the same token, he also says anyone who will no, um, not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child that, you know, um, like a little child will never enter it. Anyone who re will not receive the kingdom of God like this little child that will not come in this childlike faith, this is, is never going to inherit it. Um, so first of all, you know, in our commitment to Christ, we have to see that we have to be totally committed in a childlike faith and trust. Uh, and then moving on, we see that, um, that in this total commitment that we have to him, it's also demonstrated in obedience. And so if we read in verses 17 through 20, it says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. So immediately following this account of the little children, we skip ahead and Mark relates another event that helps us see about um, our relationship with Christ and our commitment to him and what it looks like. This story, um, you know, ought to even make the most, you know, outstanding believer of Christ among us pause and really just take a moment to, to evaluate our heart and our relationship with God um, and our relationship with Christ, because this encounter involves a man, you know, who was rich and um, when he was also young and he was a ruler. So, yes, thus we always call him what the rich young ruler. Um, but when we strive to be obedient, we demonstrate a complete commitment to Christ. Uh, and that's where this guy kind of struggles a little bit. We see first uh, of all that it says he started out when Jesus started out on his way that this man runs up and falls on his knees before him. Uh, and he calls him what? He calls him good teacher. So the fact that this man ran, it, it says is important here because he approaches Jesus in a fashion unbecoming of someone who is 
uh, of the economic status that this guy was. Like I said, we're calling him the rich young ruler. So this means he has a lot of possessions. He has a lot of things. And aristocrats never ran. And they certainly never ran towards someone. I mean, that would just be the wrong thing to do, right? Um, and they certainly did not run towards someone and then kneel down when they approach them. You know, so we see where Jesus is, is uh, approached by this man in complete respect and, uh, and eagerness, genuine eagerness and humility. And, um, you know, he underscores the respect for Jesus that, that Jesus deserves. And he refers to him, what, as a good teacher. Um, so he believes that, that Jesus is, um, you know, is who he says he is, like I said, because Jesus, Jesus says right away, you know, why did you call me good? You know, nobody except God is good, you know. So for him to approach him in this fashion, in this humble fashion, and then also call him good teacher, um, lets us kind of know that, that he had an idea uh, of who Jesus was, that Jesus could be the one you know, to help him. That's why he presents him with this question. What can I do, you know, to inherit eternal life? Um, he, there's a clear implication here that, that he knew that Jesus was, was God's son. Um, but anyway, as we go further and look at their conversation in verse 19, we see that Jesus uh, brings up God's laws into view. Uh, he talks about those Ten Commandments. And like I said, we just um, we, we just came off this intense study about all these commandments, you know, and you see that Jesus doesn't mention the first few right there when they're the ones that the first four that focus on our, uh, a person's relationship with God. And he moves on and draws his attention to the last six. And he reflects on, on these commandments that would have enabled the man to grasp the reality of his helplessness as a sinner. Um, you know, Jesus names each one of them, you know, with the 10th commandment, he substitutes the word covet with the word defraud. Um, you know, so God, remember God prohibited coveting what belonged to somebody else. And in Jesus day, um, you know, God's people connected coveted as, you know, with fraud. And so they understood the dishonest, uh, uh, that dishonest individuals, um, you know, committed fraud because they coveted what somebody else owned. And so by directing um, the focus on each commandment, Jesus wanted this man to get a fresh insight of what God was requiring in order for people to be in a right relationship with him. Now, remember, he didn't uh, give the, the commandments and, and call them to his attention, you know, because he said, you're going to have, these are the things you're going to have to do. Um, you know, he, he he's not giving them as a list to say, you do all these things and then you can inherit eternal life. Remember, we talked in last week's lesson that that's not what the commandments were for. Um, you know, that that's not why God gave us the commandments. He didn't, um, you know, need to, to see them as steps of surrendering himself to Christ, you know, um, in complete obedience, because, you know, what, what does the guy say? He says, well, you know, goodness gracious, all these I've kept since I was a little boy. So, um, you know, whoop to do. I, I got this. This is not a big deal to me. Um, you know, remember, we, we can't really keep them all. We were always going to to mess up, you know. Um, and Jesus didn't list these things and talk to him about these things. So he would see that this is the way that you get eternal life. He was trying to throw them out there to make the man understand that he could never fully live up to these things, um, that we're all going to break these things, you know that there's going to be some way that we're going to struggle with these. Yes, there, 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 there's something that we strive, you know, uh, to, to be obedient to, but we can never fully live up to them because these commandments are what they're the law and the law does not save us because we can never achieve the law. Um, you know, we can never make ourselves good enough. We strive to obey them. What out of our love and out of our commitment to him. So Jesus was listing these things to help the man see that obedience is important in our commitment to him not to give them a list of things um, that he has to follow through on in order to achieve eternal life. Obviously, the young man didn't understand the truth about what the, com the, the commandments really meant. So Jesus is addressing his misunderstanding, um, you know, and, and, and trying to help him un interpret better what the law was designed for. Um, so, we see here that, like I said, he says, I've kept all these things. So, uh, you know, our our commitment to him fully has to do with what? Our childlike faith and our obedience, not the list of things that we keep, but that we strive to obey. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus finishes so that so that he makes sure that the guy's not completely um you know, misinterpreting what he's trying to say about the commandments. So let's pick up in 21 through 22 to see what he says about them. He says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he says, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. So the last thing we see is that we demonstrate our total commitment to Christ when we follow him wholeheartedly. Um, you know, and we, 
um, at, we follow him because what? We're obedient to him. That's where that obedience comes in. We keep those commandments because what? We're following him. So these last two points go hand in hand. There's an obedience because we're following after Christ because of everything that he has done for us. We come to him in childlike faith and we strive to obey him, but our obedience is not what saves us, right? Um, uh, God died for us and, um, you know, and rose on the third day and, and made a way of escape through salvation. That's what saves us. Right. And once we accept that forgiveness and that grace, then we strive to continue to obey him and to follow after him. But sadly enough, even though we're saved, there are a lot of times still obstacles that come in our way. Now, this young man, sadly, it doesn't look like that that he ever got to that point because it says that once Christ tells him about these things, you know, and what is in his way, what his obstacle is, he says, there's one thing that you lack. Go and give everything that you have to the poor, you know, and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And, um, you know, so he tells him what to do. Um, you know, and I'll, we always talk about how Jesus told him to get rid of everything, you know, he, to call him to live in a life of poverty. You know, Jesus doesn't call us to live into a life of poverty, but he saw that this man had an obstacle that was in his way, you know, and he's only going to be able to come like a little child and entrust his life to Christ and follow him as a growing disciple if he removes the obstacle. And he sees that the obstacle in this man's life just happens to be his wealth, just happens to be his possessions. Jesus is not calling all, us, uh, all of us into a life of poverty. And quite frankly, you know, we don't know what would have happened if the man would have said, OK, you know, maybe Jesus would have said, you don't have to. I just want to know that you're willing to, you know, just like with Abraham and his son, Isaac. Remember the whole entire time, Abraham thought that he was going to have to sacrifice Isaac, you know, and they went all the way up the hill in the Old Testament, you know, and Isaac's looking around saying, dad, where's the sacrifice? You know, and he's like, don't worry, God's going to provide. And he goes all the way as far as to what? To, to tie Isaac up on the altar, you know, to get ready to take his life. And then what? Then God stops him and says, you know, I just wanted to know that you were willing to do it. I just wanted to see that your commitment was there, you know. And so we don't even know that maybe that might have been the response that Jesus would have given to this man. But it never gets that far because why? It tells us that the man's face fell. His countenance fell, I think is what uh, one translation says. You know, the man never dreamed that it would involve a complete surrender, you know, and, and it's so that that that's what we struggle with. I think a lot of times, you know, in our own lives, we want to we want to uh, have the salvation part. But we, there are still things in our lives that we want to hold back, you know, and we take Jesus, what not just as savior, but we take him also as Lord. And the only way we can trust him as Lord is, is by placing that trust in him as a child, you know, and committing to live for him by getting rid of those obstacles that are in our way. Um, you know, and this young man obviously believed that such a commitment to Christ was going to cost him far too much. And it says sorrow filled his heart and he turned in you and he went away. He simply could not bring himself to let go of his stuff. You know, holding on to his possessions mattered more to him than having eternal life by surrendering his life to Christ. And when we think about the demand that Jesus placed on the man, you know, like I said, sometimes we go, well, is he calling me into that life of poverty? No, that's that's not what this is about. Like I said, once again, you know, the obstacle that prevented the man in this account from following Christ just happened to be his wealth, you know. But we do well to look at our own relationship and see what is it that is holding us back from being fully on committed to Christ. He's fully on committed to us. He's all in for us. We found that in last week's lesson, you know, but what are the worldly things that are getting in our way? It might be our stuff. It might be our money um, that's sitting on the throne of our heart, you know, but God wants our heart. He wants all of our heart, um, you know, and, and he wants us to have a committed heart as proof that we've already been granted this access to his kingdom, you know, so we demonstrate our commitment to him through this childlike trust, through our obedience, because we're what? We're committed to following after him, you know, and he tells us to count the cost because there is a cost that's out there. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be, you know, the man in this story today. I don't want my face to fall, you know, because I say, Jesus, I just feel like I need to hold on to this one more thing. Let it go. You know, I think about the, the you know, the Disney movie, let it go, let it go. <laughs> you know, we, we just, just let it go and trust and fall completely into his arms. So this morning, you know, like, 
last week's lesson kind of ended with, um, you know, the question of salvation. And I think we have to come back to it again today. Um, you know, if, if you're trying to be good enough or moral enough in order to gain good standing with God, then forget it. It's never going to happen. You're going to have to completely trust in him because we're never going to be good enough. Um, you know, and we're going to have to fall into his arms and accept his grace and mercy that he's given to us. Um, because even at our worst, what, from last week's lesson, we find that Christ was fully committed to us, you know. But from today's lesson, we see that once we grasp that, you know, God made that first commitment to us. And because of that, we can respond to him, you know, and be fully on committed to him. And we don't have to do it in our own strength and in our own power. He's provided the Holy Spirit to walk hand in hand with us um, and to know that he is all that we need. We have to get to the place in our life when when we find that um that he's all that we need. And sometimes that means that, you know, that he has to remove things from our lives, um, you know, that are in the way. And believe it or not, if you're his child, he's going to, he's going to do what he has to do to, to get your attention. Um, you know, and, um, sometimes that can be really hard. You know, don't find yourself in that place this morning. If you're already a child of his, then ask God to help you remove those obstacles that are keeping you from, from fully having that abundant life that he wants you to experience. And if you've never met him this morning, don't be the rich young ruler that says the cost is too high. I'm going to tell you what, the cost is too high on the other end. You know, eternal life is too much for you to throw away just because of what is temporal here on this earth that you're holding on to, whatever it might be. So this morning, do that self examine nation. Find where you are in Christ this day and commit your whole life to trust and obedience to him as we continue um, these next few weeks to, to study. Next week, we're going to pick up with being committed to his word. Now that we know what it means to have a committed relationship with him, we're going to build that relationship. We're going to mature that relationship. And it starts by being committed in God's word. So let's pray. God, thank you for this lesson, these two lessons that you provided for us, dear God. We thank you that you've made a way. And, um, and dear God, you're all that we need. Um, you know, and so many times, um, you know, we forget that. Help us to understand, dear God, that um, and and help us to do it before, you know, we have to be in the place where all we can do is look up. Dear God, I know we should always be in that place when that's all that we're doing. But sometimes we, we make huge mountains for ourselves and we find ourselves in deep, deep, dark valleys, dear God, because we just wouldn't let go of that one little thing that is hindering us from having that uh, relationship that, that is fully trusting, fully on, fully committed, fully full of abundant life that you want us to experience, no matter the circumstances around us. Forgive us for those times that we fail you in that way, dear God, and help us this day to be ever newly committed to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. I hope you guys have a great week and uh, we'll look forward to picking up next week. Um, get in his word this week and uh, and study over it. We'll be ready to, to hit the ground running as we look at this passage together. Um, see you soon. Bye-bye.